Okay, so it's time to welcome our third speaker. So Eleanor, how are you? Where are you right now? Are you in London or are you somewhere more beautiful? I escaped the grey city of London and I'm currently in sunny Italy for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so wow, I must be able nice. to fall from 40 degrees Italy. 40 degrees in Italy! Wow, that's unfair. I mean, it's sunny in London today. As you may see, I turn very ghostly when my roommate comes so bright. Uh, but I am so happy to have you on this call from Italy as well. How is the situation in Italy at the moment? Please tell me, is it getting better? Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I mean, uh, I spent lockdown in London because that's mm -hmm. where I'm based. And yeah. I just arrived here like a few weeks ago to see family. But things are really good really good, like a bit of um, uh, cautious precautions, but all good, all good. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm really uh, happy that you are safe. Um, I can see you. We do have some interferences. I believe uh, your connection might not be as stable, but it should be good enough, I think, to carry us through. So let us um, let us carry on, and I'm just uh, passing this handing this over to you uh, because I know you have a lot to tell us about human-centered design and ethics and whatnot. Um, and I know you're passionate about this topic, so I'm really happy you have joined us um, in the series of these talks. So it's over to you, Eleanor. Thank you so much, Elena, and thank you, everyone. Uh, um, Oh, my uh, internet connection will stay uh, strong. So what we're going to do today has really not much to do about technology, but a lot to do with uh, thinking. So what I'm going to ask you for the next 15 minutes together is to really challenge your uh, beliefs and uh, your thinking processes, because we are going to explore together some ideas and possibilities. So the agenda is the following. We are going to spend about five minutes discussing how we think. Then we are going to uh, explore biases and finally make sense about how these two topics make sense in the context of AI. I will ask you, for some interaction, both in terms of uh, uh, voting uh, through a, a link to a poll I will share with you, but also asking questions and letting your uh, ideas uh, um, reach to me through uh, Elena and the team. So please don't be shy, really feel free to stop me at any time with any idea of, or contribution. So <clears throat> the I'm asking you to think, right? But how do we know that what we think is real? Have you ever thought about it? Because it's something that actually people have asked themselves since centuries. There was this guy, a philosopher called Plato, that wrote uh, several books. Uh, and in one of his books, uh, he discussed uh, about um, these prisoners uh, in a a group of prisoners have been living, they have never seen the outside world, only shadow of it. They have no knowledge of anything they, beyond the misery of their cave. And because the prisoners are chained facing the wall and cannot turn their head, they cannot see that there is a fire behind them. Be, um, nearby the fire, there are sometimes people passing by with their animals and objects. And the prisoners inside the cave, looking at the wall, think that the shadow of uh, animals and people and objects is everything that exists. They think that that, that shadow is the real thing. If they haven't ever known anything else. How can they realize that these shadows are not the entire reality? 
And then the story goes on telling uh, about one of his uh, slaves or prisoners that escape, goes out, uh, realizes that there is an entire war, and then goes back in the cave and tries to convince uh, his fellow prisoners that actually the shade of um, a cow is just a shade and it's not the animal itself, but they don't believe him. And um, they end up killing him because they think uh, this guy has gone mental. So obviously this is a bit of, of an exaggeration, but how do you know that what you think is real is real? There was this guy that uh, was just uh, uh, a few years older of uh, the uh, philosopher Plato. And uh, he, this guy was actually Plato's teacher. He was called Socrates, and he was very famous for uh, um, his uh, beliefs that he was sure he knew nothing at all. And he was actually walking around the city of Athens, uh, challenging people on their beliefs and saying, oh, you think that's just? Why, why do you think that's just? But what if something different happened? Or what about condition changing. And it was like at then he was uh, killed because he really annoyed uh, quite a few people in Athens, uh, simply going around and challenging people's beliefs continuously. So critical thinking is really the most powerful tool you have. And I want to check your critical thinking right now by asking you to solve together the trolley dilemma. In the trolley dilemma, um, a, a train trolley has gone uh, crazy. Um, like it can't be stopped. Uh, uh, there was a technical uh, error and now it's running super fast, 200 <laughs> miles per hour so on uh, uh, its uh, uh, track. Unfortunately, there are five people on that trail there laying down and they cannot move. And they also know that uh, the, the trolley is coming. But the trolley is coming, you know it's coming, it can't be stopped and it's going to kill the five people. However, it's our lucky day. We happen to be <laughs> at the uh, intersection uh, where uh, there is a, 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 a button that you can push. And if you push this button, the trolley is going to change direction. And instead of going in the direction of the five, five people, is going to the direction of one person only. You're there. You know that if you don't do anything, if you do not act, the trolley is surely going to kill five people. Five people that probably were not supposed to be on that trail, but here they are. However, if you act and move the switch, you're actually going to change the trajectory of the trolley and kill only one person. So I would like you to go on this website. It's called uh, menti.com. And when you're on menti.com, please use the... Um, code 923184. I'm going to be on the uh, slide and you're going to answer the question, do you move the switch, yes or not? If you say yes, you move the switch and kill one person. If you say no, you don't move the switch and five people will die as a consequence of your inaction. So thank you. Let me just go back one second in case some of you need the code. Again, 923184. I'm going to wait until I don't have a few responses. So please go on. Okay, wow. Two people decide to move the switch and kill one, okay, three. What about the others? So let me go back, www.menti.com, 923184. 
No, okay, fantastic. One person doesn't move the switch. Okay. Guys, if you wanna share on the chat why you are saying yes or why you're saying no, please go ahead. I'm really looking forward to hearing the motivation behind um, these votes. Anyone else, please? I would really like to see some more votes coming in. So let's say now that the situation is slightly different. So in this case, there is the trail, the crazy, um, and the crazy trolley on it. And there are always the five people on the trail. But instead of uh, having a switch, there is a bridge. So on the bridge, there is a very tall and large guy. This guy is so big uh, that if you actually push him down the bridge, uh, this guy is going to fall in front of the trolley and stop the trolley. So you're actually going to have to push the guy, kill him, but you're going to save the other five people. So what do you do in this case? If you refresh the page or you should be able to have the next question now coming in front of you. So same code, same link, but different question. So do you push the guy? No, okay, no, you don't. You kill five. What do other people think? No, okay, very interesting. Three, okay, four, okay. So no one of you is pushing the guy, but, but why? Because actually it's the same thing, right? You kill one versus killing five. And you still have to take an action, right? In one case, you move the switch, in the other case, you push the guy, but like, why is the result so different? Please uh, share your thoughts and comments uh, in the chat because I'm really good to hear about that. Because you know, guys, there is no right or wrong question here. It's just about what our morals guide you to think and do but why is this important in this conversation because guys this is not such a theoretical dilemma anymore right if you are designing algorithm that drive a car and the car is in a city center what what are you going to do if a dilemma happens and you know you have to sit in your office and plan all the different dilemmas, all the different situations such as this one and say, okay, like, what do we ask the algorithm to do? So for example, if there is an imminent collision in front of us, am I going to go straight and collide with the van? Or am I going to kill the stupid kid that's running without looking around to catch its ball? Or am I going to kill the old man that was instead very careful and was waiting patiently on the curb? What do you do? And if you don't know how to take a decision, how do you build a process that allows you to take a decision? Elena, feel free to stop me if there are any comments oh, coming through. Yes, I was going to ask you um, to pause just because we have a couple of comments um, in here uh, from, from the YouTube live. So we have Cherry who says, um, because in the case of the trolley, both groups of people knew that there was a possibility to die, whereas here the guy wasn't really part of the problem. So that was one response. Yeah. Um, and then Sarah is saying, I don't want to push someone to their death. I would feel bad knowing that I sacrificed someone because I would basically be a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the two responses from two um, participants of the hackathon. And then Jordan is saying, I wouldn't put anyone extra in danger. 
Thank so you, guys. Here. All right. Thank you very much, Elena, for uh, reporting the comments. They are also valuable. But let's say now in your project, you are not really designing a self-driving car. But there are some ethical decisions that you somehow are going to have to take in, in your process of building a, an algorithm that have to take some decisions by itself. And in the next uh, few minutes, we are actually going to see why this happens and why this is relevant. So our way of thinking, guys, is influenced by conscious or unconscious biases. We know it, we don't know it, but how we think and how we take decisions is really impacted by our biases. And that's why some of us were more comfortable pushing the guy. Someone wasn't even comfortable at moving the switch because it's like, yeah, they, they were not supposed to be there, but like, what if the five guys were on the trail after the barrier went down, you know, like there is the car barrier, they didn't care, they ran through it and they were on the wrong path. And the other guy like was, hey, there is no train coming, the barrier is up, I can easily walk on it. Would it change your, your, your way of taking a decision? Probably that would. But because you don't know why people are there in general, you know, if you design a self-driving car and you have to decide how this car drives, these are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself and ask other people. How are biases already happening and influencing and uh, impacting um, AI? Google's image recognition a couple of years ago uh, did label skyscraper, airplanes, cars, bikes, and gorillas. Uh, no. But the same happens with farmers or recognition performance or, and uh, gender classification. Uh, actually, recently, like a few organizations have asked Amazon to take uh, out of the market their uh, um, facial, uh, facial analysis platform because it wasn't really accurate on different uh, groups of people. People. So basically, if you are a, a black woman, you really have only 68% of chances to be recognized. Um, while it's quite easier if you are a black man, but hey, like, uh, sorry, a white man, uh, but the world is not made of white men, right? There is much more diversity out there. Who's cooking in your house? I would like to hear your voices here now telling me, oh, usually we just do sandwiches. I do sandwiches myself, my grandma, my granddad, he does amazing barbecues. Well, reality is that two different tests have shown that when you use um, software to analyze pictures, there are quite a few biases in terms of who's doing the cooking. And usually they think that women should be doing the cooking more. And they recognize, oh, the agent is actually a woman when it's clearly a man. Why is this happening? Who will offend again? So another <laughs> algorithm, um, was given like some information about um, uh, an old guy and a young kid. Um, the young kid had really like a small pity theft, like, I mean, like probably like some chocolate from the supermarket and he never offended the cane, but the risk given to the guy was double of the guy that um, had a lot of pre prior offenses and offended again after he was released from jail. But why is this important, you might ask? Well, let me share this video with you. It's just a two minutes. Computerized law enforcement sounds like something out of dystopian sci-fi, but law enforcement agencies are already using algorithms to fight crime. 
These algorithms are designed to figure out where and when crimes are likely to occur. It's called predictive policing. This is algorithmics, the space where we explore how invisible, computer-controlled, database sets of rules are making decisions for us every day. Combating and preventing crime often comes down to identifying patterns, which can be difficult for humans sifting through thousands of case reports. But it's much simpler for a computer. In predictive policing, data-centered analytical techniques powered by algorithms can help officers identify where and when crime is most likely to occur. Predpol is one of the largest companies in the space, and they use three data points, crime type, location, and time and date to build customized crime predictions. Everything is built on the observation that certain types of crimes tend to cluster in time and location. So first, the system processes years of crime data in a location to get a historical view of crime patterns. It does this through an algorithm called the Epidemic Type Aftershock Sequence Model. Catchy. Then, at least once a day, Predpol pulls the three data points in from a feed of police department's records. As new crimes occur, they're mapped against existing patterns, and Predpol's prediction engine attempts to figure out when and where similar crimes are likely to occur. But algorithmic law enforcement isn't just about policing. It's also been used in parole decisions to assess an inmate's risk of recidivism. According to the Wall Street Journal, parole boards in at least 15 states have used these types of tools. Okay, let me stop it here. So <laughs> this kind of tool is already being used to decide who is going to um, have more possibility to reoffend. And these algorithms are not always accurate. And why does this happen? Because bias in AI will happen and already happen unless AI is built from the start with inclusion in mind. And the most critical step in creating inclusive AI is to recognize where and how bias infects the system. So there are three fundamentals to build the AI model. So one is robustness. The system should be safe and secure in a way that data cannot be compromised. The model needs to be fair the system should use training data and models that are free of biases. And also they need to be explainable. So the system should provide a decision that humans can understand. But like we are discussing a lot about biases, what are they? Sorry, Elena, I'm moving you picture, okay. So a bias is a, a, a disproportionate, a weight in favor or against an idea or thing, usually in a way that's unfair. So this is the stuff you agree with. <laughs> and that's it. You are really in favor of something just because you are, right? You, you don't really think it through too much. There is a very interesting research from uh, these uh, um, three guys, Chu Murillo and uh, Ibras. And you can read all the work um, and find uh, further links and analysis about their work in uh, um, this medium uh, um, article uh, that you can find at the link here. But I'm just going to highlight with you the five main biases that they have very effectively categorized with clear example of why these biases apply in AI and apply to your work and your reality. So all these five biases are currently applying to AI and some of them are the reason why we have seen that um, women are the one that should do more of the cooking. <laughs> and one of these reasons is uh, because of the data set biases. So data set biases um, is when the data used to train machine learning models doesn't represent the diversity of the user base. It's a bit like when you're a kid, right? You look at the world and you look at the world with uh, limited points because you just know what you have learned in five years and 
what your parents and grandparents have taught you. Like you haven't been to school yet. Now that you are 14, 16, 17, you know so much more because your data set has expanded. So now that you are designing your solution, you are building your AI project, you really need to think about these three questions. Does the data sample you are using, including everyone in your user base? If not, have you tested your result with people who weren't part of your sample? Or what about the people on your AI teams? Are they inclusive, diverse, and sensitive to recognizing bias? And this is so important. This is a conversation that everyone in the team needs to have. Guys, I work usually with like several hundred of startups per year. Do you think they have this kind of conversations within their team when like they hire uh, a new engineer? Do you think they have these conversations? Well, usually they don't. And that's so important to be changed because otherwise we will still have algorithms that are built with people not really thinking that the data they are using are not representative of their entire user base. The second bias is associations bias. How does it work? It's a bit like when you're a kid and you decide, oh, why don't we um, play to be a veterinary? And like the boy is like, oh, I, I'm a veteran. And the girl is like, I can be a doctor as well, you know. But in this case, uh, associations bias is when data uh, that are used to train the model reinforce and multiplies cultural biases. And that's what we saw before when the algorithm thought that women were the one cooking. So what can you do about it? Ask yourself the following question. Are your, result, are your results making associations that, they, that reinforce stereotypes? Or uh, can you actually break undesirable or unfair associations? Is your data set already classified and labo? The third bias is called automation bias. And that's about when automated decision of the right personal, social, or cultural considerations. And, and that's like something that you can ex, um, like uh, perceive when um, there are results that are telling you that something should be in a way instead of what you actually prefer. So you're looking for uh, um, a, an article or a product online and like algorithms are telling you what you should like overriding personal, social or cultural considerations. What can you do about it? So these are the question. Would real diverse customer agree with your algorithm conclusion? Is your AI system overruling human decisions? And how do you ensure that human, the human point of view is included in the loop? Here is straight about, okay, how do I, um, make uh, different perspective included. Because an example is like um, in, in Europe, for example, there is a, a, a notion of beauty. So sometimes uh, algorithm uh, for filters apply, um, yeah, filters that make a person look in a certain way because that's how people or the algorithm has been trained thinking that, well, if you have a, such, a certain size, a certain aspect, height of a certain size, of a certain color, you are more beautiful. The next bias is in the interaction bias. And it's when humans tempers with AI and create bias results. It's a bit when uh, um, we were kids and uh, uh, playing the telephone game. So I'm telling you a, a phrase and then you have to pass it on. And by the end of it, uh, we look at the result. 
it, sometimes it happened that you wanted to change a word or two, right? Um, and this is exactly what can happen with uh, the interaction bias. Humans deliberately uh, input maybe racist or sexist language into a chatbot. So what can you do about uh, um, preventing this bias? So you actually have to check and put check in places to identify malicious intents toward the system. And you know, sometimes it's not like when we say we do it on purpose, it's not like a person is like, oh, I'm, I want to do it against the system. I want to do something bad. It, it just can happen that you are annoyed with uh, someone for like, you are a, a Manchester uh, football fan and you're really annoyed with Liverpool football fan and you're working on something like that, like, like a chatbot for like a, 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 a sport business and you put something that it's deliberately against Liverpool fans, right? So what, what else can you do? You can ask, what does your AI system learn from people? Uh, did you design the real time interaction and learning? What does uh, that mean for what it reflects back to customers? Stop and really ask yourself these questions because biases can be conscious, but most of the times are really unconscious. And then there is the confirmation bias. This is like one of my favorite. It's like when a kid um, goes around with it and start thinking really likes so, so the couple on the first Chris, uh, Christmas and then for the birthday friends are like oh he really more of that for it so confirm really interprets for me confirms what you think already it's a bit when uh, um, you are uh, on uh, um, online and you start seeing uh, um, advertising uh, or uh, opinion pieces that confirm uh, what you already think or uh, your taste or what you already want. So how uh, an algorithm that bias free? So first of all, does your algorithm build on and reinforce any popular preference? Is your AI system able to evolve dynamically as your customer changes over time? And is your AI system helping your customer to have a more diverse and inclusive view of the world? And to do that, you strong governance, and with this, I'm about to finish the presentation and leave time to your questions data are fundamental you really need to have checks on data for example possible action you can take identify trustworthy data sources or create your own if you create your own you have to make sure test that uh, it's bias free create data statement on data creator demography and so on Aggregate or redact personal identifiable data, ensure diversity among like uh, the people labeling data. So even like who's working the data is diverse and identify outliers and investigate whatever they are actual outliers or errors in the data. Obviously this is a continuous process. It's not something that starts and stops at any time but that's why what we were saying at the beginning of these 20 minutes together is so relevant guys you need to think you really need to stop and challenge yourself to think a bit better a bit harder and a bit deeper because biases are real and unless you are not aware on it and actively stop them from having an impact your products will have biases that might have real and serious uh, uh, consequences uh, on your users. Any questions? I'm here to answer them. Thank you.
हेलो Right, we're back. Uh, we're back with Eleanor, uh, and I am checking the um, questions from the audience. But this was a very, very insightful uh, presentation on all of the biases. Um, so I am looking to see whether anyone is asking um, the questions. There is none at the moment, but people have been making uh, comments about um, the trolley and the people. Uh, the death and everything else. Uh, so everyone who is watching this call still, please, if you have any questions, now would be a really good time to ask Eleanor everything. Um, I'm going to wait. And in the meantime, I am going to ask you, I know you have worked with a lot of startups. Uh, so this is not your traditional setup. This is not your traditional accelerator. Uh, these are young people who, um, some of them for the first time exploring um, exploring AI, exploring um, business. Okay, everyone, we have just lost Eleanor. I think she's struggling with the connection. Sorry, my internet connection completely broke, went down. I'm really sorry. That's okay, I gathered that. Um, okay. So the question I was asking you is, um, what advice would you offer to these young people who are for the first time exploring ethics, um, AI, uh, business and entrepreneurship matters? So these are your very, um, I mean, it's not your traditional setting. They're not adult, um, adult uh, startups. Um, so there is a lot more for them to learn um, and uh, I'm wondering whether there are any specific tips you could offer them because it's only day day four. Yes, absolutely. The, the only uh, very uh, concrete things you guys can do is speak with as many different people as you can because uh, this is an ongoing conversation. There's no book or article that's going to give you answers uh, or solutions. Uh, you are the ones that are going to develop uh, solutions uh, based on your uh, values uh, and morals uh, and your biases. Um, I, I've realized that when you travel and uh, live in different countries, speak with different peoples, your uh, perceptions of some of your beliefs changes. So how, like if you have something you're strongly sure about um, uh, in terms of uh, product market fit or what is right or what is just or what is good. Just go out there and speak with other people. Like here uh, in the, the accelerator, you have the amazing opportunity to be together with uh, uh, motivated and driven other young people from different backgrounds. Sometimes speaking to each other. That's the most important thing you can do. That's the most helpful way to break or work on any existing bias you have. Brilliant. No, that's very good advice. Um, and um, what would you suggest um, they should try avoid doing? What, what were the common mistakes that you have been seeing recently with startups? Uh, what are the do's and the don'ts um, in terms of the product development cycle in general? Um, what should they be mindful of? A very good question. Thank you, Elena. Be mindful of your data set. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't think that because there are a lot of data, the data are okay. And don't think that um, you don't actively have to double and triple check them how you label them, uh, how you work on them. Um, because sometimes make things technically working, we forget about uh, like the, the reason why behind it or the morals or the ethics behind it. Uh, and the second um, complete suggestion that you should do is build a governance system. So sometimes startups build a lot of uh, uh, operational or so technical checks. They go to market very quickly to test their solution, which is fantastic. That's great. Do it. And at the same time, 
also build very early on a, a governance models, which means which checks do we need to put in place before we start to make sure that our uh, solution is value driven and bias free. Perfect. And um, and last question, Eleanor, uh, before I, I let you go, uh, we have already introduced uh, them today to value proposition canvas, and we will be covering business model canvas on on, on Friday as well. Um, is there an ethics canvas that we could add into our toolkit that we could explore? Maybe some some checklist, something where um, you could say, you know, have you done this? Check. Um, have you looked at your data set? Check. Um, do you know whether it's diverse? Check. Um, you know, because I'm, I'm just wondering whether there is a tool that's out there. I know ODI have developed like an ethics canvas, but maybe you know of something else which is a bit more beginner friendly for young people um, to really explore and include into their product development. Because I always insist ethics should be, should go on a par with with technology that they're developing. So I try to introduce ethical concepts uh, on day one, basically from day one. Um, but I also would like them to uh, to basically use some, some handbook or some toolkit that they can refer to, not maybe from the very beginning when they're still not sure what kind of data they need, what kind of um, technology they will use. But maybe again, over the weekend, I could encourage them, well, do you remember Eleanor left you with that toolkit? Um, you know, can you please look at it again and can we please check against it whether you are on track or whether there are other questions um, or stuff you should be concerned about? Ah, I see your screen now. <laughs> yes, uh, Elena. So uh, I'm not sure it's exactly the tool you um, are looking for. But, um, this is the machine learning canvas. Uh, which can help you to set up an AI model. This mm -hmm. um, machine learning canvas uh, includes like data sources, so some checks on uh, which raw data are you using, the collection of the data, so what's the process, um, and the value proposition, but also the decision, how predictions uh, uh, used to make decision, but uh, how, how are they used? Like how are uh, prediction used to make decisions? Um, this is not very easy or user friendly. Um, it's very technical, uh, but it provides a bit of a checklist, especially for uh, the data source. Mm -hmm. Um, which raw data sources can we use, both internal and external? And then uh, are we infringing individual or company rights, or privacy in using these data sources? Um, are these uh, uh, data uh, collect, um, like in what way? Are the subjects aware of their data being collected? What are the um, access control of the subjective of the subjects over their data? So we, this is a bit of a checklist you guys can can use, but it's not really simple. So probably one of the easiest things you can do, guys, is just asking these questions. Like um, I'm very happy to share with you the slides. Um, these questions are probably the checklist you can uh, go through when you think about your data and the idea of your solution. Brilliant. Uh, if you could share, I would be very grateful because we can then share this with the teenagers and ask them to almost, uh, we might even create a checklist of our own and just remind them um, to refer to that. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Eleanor, uh, for this. And I know we're going to see you again next week where you will be introducing us to the pitching and what should be in your deck and what should not be in your deck and the, the do's and the don'ts. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. So that workshop will happen most likely internally um, to with young people themselves. So you will have 44 young people 
to coach <laughs> in pitching and in how to create those decks. Um, thank you so much. I am really, really grateful for your time. Um, and um, I know you are in Italy with your family. And uh, so we are very grateful for, uh, for such a fantastic presentation and outline of all the biases and the ethics we should be concerned about. Okay, so everyone um, say uh, thank you. I know you're all already sort of um, have been very active and engaging with us on YouTube. So this is the very last um, talk and I will be seeing you again tomorrow um, at five o'clock um, in the evening um, and we will have other speakers join us. And we do have a fantastic workshop happening on Sunday uh, for the participants. It's in quantum, um, quantum computing via comics by Kitty from Microsoft. And we will have you all join us internally um, in Zoom. But we promise to share that workshop as well with the world. So thank you for joining us. I will be seeing you shortly. And you will be finding me in Discord actively jumping from one team to another. And Eleanor, if you are keen and curious about what we get up to in Discord, you are very welcome to join us as well. So um, thank you so much, Eleanor. I will end the stream now. and um, and. Uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your evening uh, with the 40 degrees. I am jealous, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure to be your you. guest and um, we'll see you soon. We will see you soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And bye, everyone.